All right, Alex Kopach, nice to see you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah, um, okay, so today um, with the red shirt effect, we have brought on a special guest, which I am so pumped to talk to. Uh, this is my friend, Alex Kopach, Olympic gold medalist, um, native to the London, Ontario region. Um, you went to school Mother Teresa, right? That's right. Yeah, okay, good. So there'll be a lot of Mother Teresa teachers and students watching, which is fantastic. Um, my name is Michelle Lang. I'm the athletic coordinator of TV Raw, and I'm just really excited to um, bring this particular uh, topic, um, which is talked about a lot, but um, just the topic of uh, transferable skills from one sport to another. So whether or not you're a parent watching this, you're a student or, or even a coach, a teacher coach, I think what we're going to talk about today will be valuable um, for anyone. So um, again, thank you so much for joining me and I'm really excited about this. So um, so my first question is, I know you grew up in London um, in surrounding area, but um, what sports did you play growing up? Um, like were they like specific? Um, so yeah, go ahead. I did all sorts. Um, so as young as I can remember, uh, summer times was predominantly soccer and then winter times was swimming. Um, so I went through all you know, the swimming levels, uh, lifeguarding stuff, swam competitively for a bit. Um, in soccer, I got up to a premier level. I mean, like Ontario premier. Um, and it was always encouraged to do sports that were relatively low maintenance. Um, just kind of just the economic situation, the family growing up. So uh, from those two sports, I, I ended up realizing that, I mean, I had a lot of fun from the team aspect playing soccer. I mean, it's kind of in your blood when you're, you have a European uh, family. Um, the swimming is really cool because swimming is a very individual sport where you push yourself as hard as you can. And there's always that setup where it's just like, do you, do you push a little further before you take a breath? And so you're fighting against your natural instincts to kind of, you know, but if you're trying to get a personal best or, or, or win the race, sometimes you make little uh, short-term sacrifices like that. Um, no different than in a, in a game, but I found uh, the combo of the individual aspects as well as the team aspects set me up for um, a lot of good, um, I would say initially use your, your, your terminology right now, transferable skills is when I started playing more serious sports in high school. Okay, so that, okay, that's a good um, segue then. I don't have this on my list, but um, what sports did you play in high school? Because, um, you know, high school, sometimes some schools don't have swimming. Yeah. Um, but yeah, did you play any of the team sports in high school? Uh, I played lots of team sports in high school. I mean, I guess to be fair, like my team sports in grade school, um, as uh, summer and winter was just kind of like my own personal stuff on the side. But I did on, uh, I did track in grade school. I was on the basketball team, volleyball team. Um, gymnastics. Um, and that was all just through grade school, whatever was provided whenever it came up. And in high school, I did uh, football is the primary one throughout. Um, that's when I started to get bigger and people started noticing that I should probably give it a shot. Um, football was great for many reasons. And, and a big piece of it was actually uh, the focus that we had with the coaches that we had um, on the weightlifting. And that was very good because the discipline was there to, to try and get bigger and stronger. And we were all motivating each other. We had a very, very incredible group of young men back then. Um, and we all, I mean, we were extreme, super successful as far as uh, football in London goes. Uh, and then in the off seasons of football, I would then be on the swim team. Um, and very happy to have been on an offset team with the four by 100. Um, and then I did track in the summer times. That's when I did shot put, and then I would, you know, do a do a sprint race here and there. Uh, let's say I did badminton, uh, made it to Wassa with uh, mixed doubles, um, and I did uh, rowing for a short term. So I essentially try to take on whatever you know. One sport goes away, I filled it with the next one. Now my coaches hated that from football because they just wanted me to focus on just keeping my size and getting stronger, but. Um, yeah, I just love trying to see how fast I could learn a new skill. Uh, yeah, and so you're a true lover of sport and passionate about sport. It actually almost mimics my high school um, experience as well. I just, I loved all sports. And when high school was done, um, going to university was a real big change, right? Because now you can't, what? You can't do all of those fun things. Yeah. Um, and that, that's the unique thing about high school is that it is literally the best time of your life because you get a chance to meet all of these people and you get to experience all these amazing memories and it's all through the vehicle of sport which mm -hmm. 
which I which I love. This is that's why I wanted to become a high school teacher in the first place. So then, when you went to Western, that's where you went to school, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So when you went to Western, what was your main focus there in terms of sport? Because you you had so such a big background. Actually, I, I very unfortunately had to uh, take a hiatus from sport. It was something I promised my parents. So leaving grade 12, I mean, I'd gone to OFSA for multiple uh, sports and events, especially in track. And uh, we won cities, we won OFSA for football, and just kind of leave it on a high note. So in spite of the offers I had to play for different universities, um, I went to just focus to be an engineer. And I still went to the gym regularly. But instead of sports, I started filling my my free time. And not I mean that I had much of it, but I filled it with clubs and things like that. So uh, I was on the, the race car team for, for the engineers. Um, I did a lot of the uh, dance clubs like salsa, tango, uh, swing. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It all started with, uh, with, with, with a uh, romantic interest in high school that was Latin. So I... <laughs> <laughs> I definitely chased the salsa very, very heavily, but um, it didn't take long before that gap of not having sports started to really take its toll. And um, I was still very strong coming out of high school and I was still training heavily. Um, and Jason Tunks, a uh, discus thrower, he went to uh, Banting, um, had a gym and a friend of mine took us there. And uh, basically, he's just like, you're way too strong to not be doing anything at a university level or national level. And he says, let's, let's, let's see what happens. So took me under his wing and started training me a little bit more intensely. And I put on a lot of weight and a lot of strength very quickly. Um, and so next thing I knew, I was about 275, 280 pounds. And I was uh, definitely a shoe in for the shot put, uh, for the throwers anyways. Um, and I did shot put for Western in my third year and fourth year university. So this, I did not know this. I can't believe I didn't know this. I didn't know that you weren't all four years. So this is, yeah. okay, so this is huge. This is actually makes this even crazier. So I walked up, touched my toes and I made it, I was 12th at uh, CIs my first year and I was fifth my second year. Um, and then in that first year, I made the sprint standard for the team. Um, I was top eight, the purple and white meet. Not that they would ever let me sprint. And then my second year, <laughs> I made the senior sprint standard and then I was 280 pounds. Um, and then that's when people started pushing me in different directions to go more seriously as a professional athlete. Okay. So this is really interesting because I would think a lot of athletes out of high school, once they go to university or college or whatever, they would be like, well, if I don't start right away, I'm done. Like I won't be able to do it. Yeah. And here you're saying that that actually is not the case and you're an Olympic gold medalist. So I, I like that, I really like that. So then what what made you think, was that when the idea of bobsledding happened? Like how did that idea actually come into it, come into play? Yeah, so things just started kind of moving so quickly because I started realizing that I, I was not the average athlete. And so even the first time I walked into the Western uh, Strength uh, Center, um, I saw that not only was I, you know, strong, but I was stronger than most, if not all of the football players, regardless of their position. And then within, you know, a couple more months of training with, with Tunks, I was the strongest guy in the gym handedly. And then it became, okay, so I can outrun all these other guys too. There was whispers of maybe this guy should play football. So there was an idea that maybe I'd play fullback for, for the Mustangs um, to, to help set me up uh, to, to do maybe football outside of, of the university. Um, one of the uh, quarterback coaches, uh, Coach Bone, um, had, had said, I mean, I was very honored to hear it, but said that I could potentially be a, a walk-on defensive end in the NFL. And so that's when I started thinking, you know, m maybe I should really explore this because um, I was always a good athlete. I was never the, the positions you play in high school doesn't really put a highlight on you, right? I mean, I was, I was an O-line, D-line, special teams. I was always on the field, but I was never the one scoring the points. So it's not like people can notice the athleticism and, and whatnot. But, but now you're in a space where, as an individual, here's your strength, here's your speed. All of a sudden, there's, there's definitely more in the tank. So um, there was a coach, sprint coach, Marty Robertson, and he actually did bobsled 20, I want to say, 2000, 2008, 2006, I can't remember exactly, but he was with Looters for a little bit. Uh, in his two years, he, he had a pretty good, pretty good experience. And, and he had said, you'd be a freak athlete for bobsled. And I, I had no idea at the time, A, how does one just get into bobsled? And then B, uh, that was approaching 2013, 2014. So the next thought that came to my head is, well, what if I could actually just walk on and go to the Olympics? How crazy of a story would that be? So literally from, from letting go of sport, 
to getting to a space where let's see what happens. I got to a space where I'd be crazy not to try to go further now. And so I made peace with the fact that I wouldn't be looking for a job right away after graduating and put all my eggs into the uh, bobsleigh basket. And ultimately it was a good choice, but it was a scary choice. Well, yeah, <laughs> your parents must have been freaking out. Yep. Um, okay, so okay, so then you take basically that subset of skills that you had learned through multiple mm -hmm. sports. Mm -hmm. You know, a few people talking to you about what you could also do, your love of sport as well, your passion for sport as well. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to give, you know, bobsledding a, a shot. So how do you get from when you finish university in training to where you actually bobsled Canada says, yeah, this yeah. guy's the real deal. So what they end up doing when they, when they, when they recruit and scout is they send out invites to all the strength coach coaches across Canada with the universities. And if they see someone they think is, is, is uh, so-called freaky enough, then they'll give them an opportunity. And they are looking for bigger bodies that are strong and fast. And that's definitely a combo that's very important. Um, so basically I got one of these invitations and went to McMaster for the first test. And when I was there, I mean, uh, I realized very quickly, they said that I needed to lose, um, about 30 pounds. So from my first, uh, camp to the second camp, it was about three months. I lost, uh, actually almost 40 pounds in those three months. Um, and I then, yeah, I started working on my running and just kept, you know, kept lifting. I was a very strong lifter. So I just kept working on my running technique with Marty and set me up that I was fast enough to be invited to go to Calgary. And I packed whatever I could for a week, bought a ticket, flew out. Um, basically from day one to the end of that week camp, I improved significantly to the point where they said, why don't you stick around and train with the Olympic guys? Let's see what happens come uh, September. So my one week suitcase had to last me now three months. And then I ended up testing well, but, um, because you knew and, and, you know, just team dynamics, right? So, uh, they said, you're not going to make the team. However, we want you to stick around. And, uh, and I said, well, I just need, I need funding. And they said, no problem. We'll get you carding. Uh, and then the rest is history. I did my first uh, development cup that, uh, that year. And what year was that? Cause you were was, in 2018. So what yeah. year was that? So 2013 summer into 2014. And so I finished my, my uh, North American cup, like development circuit, February of 2014. And then and I went to, um, then I went to, to, to Europe to, to do my studies. Okay. And so then you basically trained for four years in order for mm -hmm. that next round of Olympics. Right. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Because you would have been almost too early when you got there to Calgary. Yeah. Like, I mean, that would have been freak. You know, the, the crazy thing, the side story behind that is um, the Polish team tried to pull, uh, try to, try to get me on their team. And so right, I had bad. an opportunity to make, uh, to make the 2014 Olympics, but I mean, it obviously it was for the best that I didn't, because who knows if I would have stuck it out because that would have been enough to say like, yep, I went done, yes. you know, yeah, yeah. next thing. <laughs> yes. Life has a funny way of turning out exactly how it's supposed yep. to be. Right. Um, okay. So then what would you say then in terms of cross transferable skills? Mm -hmm. Cause they obviously <clears throat> were important for you. Um, I guess my question is what are some of the benefits of cross transferable skills in sport? Well, I can say in any sport, the, the, there's essentially two primary objectives that every athlete needs, and that's to maximize their body awareness and the control of their center of mass. So their balance. And in order to do that, you have to give different stimuli and through this different stimuli, you then achieve that understanding of where you need to be and how it needs to feel at any given point. So the athletes that are so-called savants that pick up a movement very quickly are either able to conceptualize it very fast in their mind and, and then put themselves in those positions, or they can feel where, why those positions are the right, right position. So some people are just lucky and they have the right technique right away. But what's really happening is they're putting themselves in that efficient position immediately because that's what feels right based on where they're balancing, based on, on where the ball needs to go, for example. Like some people have a natural pitch. Some people are natural sprinters. But all of that isn't just simply you're born with it. That means ridiculous. You can't be born with that movement pattern, mm -hmm. but you're born with an inherent understanding of where your balance is. And uh, that awareness gets developed more aggressively if you put yourself in new scenarios. 
So if you do something that you've been doing for thousands and thousands and thousands of reps, you stop thinking about the movement. But if you put yourself in a new situation, you reevaluate how that movement is. And that gives you that fast problem solving to adapt to every situation. So I've heard the argument that decathletes are some of the most freakiest athletes on the planet because they have to be very good at a series of different skills. And that sets them up for success in multiple sports. Mm -hmm. Take a guy like Damian Warner. I was just uh, going to say obvious. Yeah. He was a good basketball player, but in general, his ability of his, his proprioception, his, his center of balance, and of course his, his uh, genetic gifts set him up to be good in any sport. But clearly, as he does decathlon, you can see within each of his disciplines, like he could have been a stellar sprinter alone. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He could have been a pretty good high jumper or long jumper on his own. You know, uh -huh. so these are the things where you don't get there until you start challenging yourself by giving different problems for your body to solve. I love the way that you put that because I've never actually thought of it in that way about introducing new stimuli into the scenario because that's really kind of how science works anyway but the way that you put it and you put that twist on as an athlete um is brilliant i i would never have thought of it in that way i always used to think that your eyes and in my in my case as an athlete i thought my eyes were my my best um attribute because i would watch what other people would do and then i would mm -hmm. attribute that and try and replicate it myself mm -hmm. So good body spatial awareness of where I was, my body was in space to be able to replicate that movement so that, you know, I could be successful. And then so here's an example with the, yeah. the way my coach was, was he encouraged me to do all sorts of very, what I would say, obscure and eclectic techniques. But in the end, the constant goal was to get that body awareness. So what will we do? So we learn with the eyes, mm -hmm. we close our eyes and we feel with the body. So oh. the most important parts for an athlete, to be honest, is your foot, the foot contact and the way you interact with the ground, because from there, you have a clear balance position to start from. So mm. your foot is in the right stance, the right place. You should be able to tell yourself, did I lean to the right? Did I turn to the right? Am I staying straight on just by understanding where I place my one foot to the other? So we'd be doing right. drills where as I'm doing my drills, I'm closing my eyes. I'm feeling where my knee is. I'm feeling where the other one is. And I'd open my eyes and go, oh, I deviated 10 degrees to the right. Right. Why is that? Maybe I was pushing too hard with one leg than the other. Right. You know, even with Olympic lifting, there's, there's so much to do with balance where it's like you should be able to do it with your eyes closed. But that's scary. You keep your eyes open for safety. Yeah, yeah, but when yeah. it gets to a space where you're, it's a do or die scenario of performance, there is no space for thought anymore. It's just reflex. Right. And that, that could be the difference between a gold medal and a, mm -hmm. a silver medal. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So this is good. So transferable skills, why they're important, the benefits mm -hmm. of them, which we we've already covered. What would you say um, right now to an athlete, uh, a student athlete that's in high mm -hmm. school, um, that is coming out of this pandemic mm -hmm. and either coming back to high school or potentially going to university. I mean, that's almost two questions in itself, yep. but let's maybe just focus on the first one. Like we're coming out of the pandemic. Hopefully this will pandemic will be over sooner rather than later. And mm -hmm. I'm an athlete. I've been sitting at home for the last however many months I'm coming back to school. What would be, um, your advice to them? Well, in a purely athletic capacity, I'd say start moving. Um, and that would be something as simple as just doing intervals with your with jogging to get the blood flow going, work on your your mobility. Um, but I wouldn't put all my eggs in the basket of which which sport am I supposed to focus on. I would definitely encourage everybody to try every team uh, and and to have the goal. Can I make the team? And once you've made the team, have the goal. How fast can I learn this to become one of the better guys in the team or girls on the team? Um, because in that struggle, in that challenge, you're going to learn a lot about your own body control. And not to mention, as you're doing different sports, it requires different energy systems to be managed. So if you think you're going to be very strong and then a great marathon runner, think again. That's, that's, uh -huh. that's, that's absurd. Um, but if you know that you want to be more power sports, then transfer from, I mean, it doesn't have to be a contact sport, but you can transfer from sprinting to shot put. I mean, I mean there's more weight gain required, but it's still fast, short uh -huh. burst. Um, you could be a short distance swimmer and transfer over to sprinting. Same thing. I mean, these are the kind of ideas where if you know what your best, um, tools are, 
if everyone had the opportunity to do a genetic profile, you'd see very quickly if you had a, a power gene or not. Right. And if you have that, you might as well focus on power explosive sports. If you don't have that, do endurance sports. Um, but definitely allow yourself the opportunity to try more things and then mm -hmm. find, are you better with your hand eye? Are you better with your foot eye? Are you better with linear? Right. Long, yes, and long term. So it's yeah. interesting how you talk about those small goals because often, um, and, and we do this as adults too, often we're like, well, we have to get to the end goal. The end goal is, you know, you know, for high school athletes might be winning an offset championship. Mm. But the way that you just said it was breaking it down into small increments of smaller goals. So just making the team. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you don't make the team, what else could you be doing, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to maybe next year, maybe make that team. And then if you've made that team, maybe focus on a smaller goal in that, like maybe making the starting lineup, or if they're a long distance runner, for example, maybe they're focusing on, um, you know, their split times, um, those sorts of things. So, you know, incremental goals um, for each athlete are unique to each mm -hmm. athlete and mm -hmm. should be, um, those small goals should be monitored and created for you, for the individual athlete. Absolutely. Um, so I like the way that you, I really like the way that you put that. An important um, mindset to, to have is trying to be the hardest worker in the room. This is something yeah. that coaches appreciate the effort and you'll get more opportunities and it only teaches you more about you. So yes, uh -huh. you're tired. Yes, you're hungry. Still try to outwork people around you. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that gives you a very interesting drive long-term and it'll always pay off. Yeah. When I, um, yeah, when I was growing up, my dad had this, um, he would always tell me, and I was young, like, like grade four, grade five playing, you know, competitive sport there were not a lot of females back in those days playing competitive sport. And there were, weren't actually a lot of opportunities either. So like we're talking like 1988 um, mm. area. So I had to play a lot of times with the boys, which benefited me a lot. But he, my dad would always say, find someone better than you on the court and outrun them doesn't matter who it is, but work harder than that one person. Just pick one person and outrun them. And then I would take that literally. And I would like point and be like that guy right over there. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah. Beat him up and down the court, steal the ball from him, take a pass away from him. Whatever it was, it was, he made me just focus on one person and really focus in on that. And I, I think that that was um, very, very helpful. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. a PD day. And, uh, I am, I am doing this broadcast from my daughter's room. Yeah, <laughs> so proud. But I think that that mindset is really, really important to have as an yeah. athlete um, to be able to go and say, okay, mm. if it's training time, I have to train harder than mm. X, Y, Z if I want to see some improvement. For sure. Now, something that where now, because I started from that mindset and, and, and I would just like to discuss the pitfalls of that mm. mindset. Now, if you put a target on someone's back, um, you're, you might only be willing to be better than just that person. Mm -hmm. And then how do you become above and beyond? So if you set your target after you can take on, let's say you can outwork everyone on your team, you need to start thinking bigger, always have that next goal. Because if you, if you're complacent that you beat the people on your team and you're in high school, sorry, but it's just high school. Once exactly. you meet some real athletes outside of it, you're going right. to realize you wasted a lot of your time. So um, definitely for short-term goals, wonderful it's wonderful having somebody to try and beat absolutely mm -hmm. but don't don't just sit and go i did it i'm good but have something week. else i want to out i want to for example i go in the gym i want to outlift the guys that are older than me right they're older than me they should be stronger if i can outlift them they should be embarrassed right yes you know i'm a big fat shot putter i mean i was never i was always in the i mean very well <laughs> well built for 280 but if i beat any one of these sprinters today they should be embarrassed Right, right. Oh, I, I beat I beat three quarters of them. <laughs> they should all hand in your spikes. Go home. Yeah, I love that though, and I love um, I love your story of of that it wasn't a linear path, and it wasn't um, it didn't really have a lot of flow to it. I actually think mm -hmm. that that's what makes it unique and and um, relatable and authentic because. Mm -hmm. 
I think we have, as Canadians, we have this idea that, you know, the boy is going to go to the NHL and he starts and he plays, you know, house league and then he goes to AAA and then from AAA he goes on to, you know, the NA OHL and then the NHL. And, and, you know, we grew up with that belief system. Um, so when it doesn't fit that mold, sometimes it can, you can feel like, well, maybe yeah. I haven't been very successful, but the world is quite big um, and it's vast and there's a lot of different opportunities and the path does not have to be a straight line. That's right. And you also don't have to be a failure if you didn't make the NHL. You right. might be a great athlete, but then you can take those hockey skills, again, yeah. understanding your movements, understanding your center of mass and apply it to a sport and track and field, apply it to rugby, apply it to football. I mean, my goodness, mm -hmm. if you're just the best at an older age, a lot of people need to understand, especially the young men that are watching, some of you guys are still going through some of your hormone peaks. Mm -hmm. Don't be frustrated that you're not big enough. You're not going to be at your physical peak until you're in your 20s. Mm -hmm. you know, between 26 and 36 is a man's peak. Um, the biggest thing I would encourage, I mean, I would have loved to have done this talk sooner, but my back is a mess and you really need to take seriously. Those that are trying to become strong, mm -hmm. please, please, please focus on having someone coach you with correct lifting technique, because when mm -hmm. it gets to the space of your body strong enough to lift the weight, hopefully you're in the right positions because uh, the difference between a good training session and an injury, we're talking millimeters, fractions of a loss of focus. Well, I actually love that's almost like where we're at right now, like in terms of this, this interview, it's, it's a perfect segue because with the red shirt effect in TV raw, what we've been doing is we've been working with two London uh, organizations. The first one is total package hockey. Um, and then the other one is um, Femmel's fitness and the, we are providing each week proper training for any student. Uh, any any student, you don't even have to be an athlete, any student in Thames Valley and London uh, District um, to be able to have an opportunity to have five, uh, sometimes six trainers that they can choose from. These are the highest performance trainers that they could you could get in this area mm -hmm. and um, to give proper, proper coaching. Um, and it's totally free. So I would encourage any athlete that's watching this right now, or if you're a parent watching this to get your kids on there to see our amazing trainers and, um, and, and make sure that you're, you know, doing the proper sequence and the proper movement patterns that these trainers are giving. And as, instead of going on to some random YouTube video, right. That's or some right. random uh, Instagram video to say, Hey, this is, I'm going to do this. Um, get some live feedback. Might as well. Get, Absolutely. And it's in real time too. So it's great. They can work out, they work out with you, which is awesome. Okay. So listen, thank you so much. This was just awesome. And I, I, it's amazing how I didn't know some of um, your story, but uh, it's a beautiful story. Um, and um, I'm grateful that you took your time today. Um, and I hope people, um, if they have questions, um, they can feel free to email me and I will make sure that I will send them to you when we're done. That'd be great. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much, Alex, and have a great day.